You will not get into medical school if your entire pre-med identity is your 4.0 GPA and 523 MCAT score. Here's a pre-med with a 3.96, 521 MCAT, zero acceptances. And another, 3.8 GPA, 517 MCAT, zero acceptances. Today, I'll show you a 4.0 GPA, 523 MCAT pre-med who got a full ride scholarship to a competitive California medical school. He will graduate not only with zero debt, they'll actually pay him for four years to go to their medical school. If you're anything like me, a normal pre-med who likes normie things like basketball and teaching, you'll see how this pre-med makes an exceptional level of impact in his boring generic interests. And that's enough to earn him a full ride scholarship to a competitive California medical school. All right, let's talk about another AMCAS application review, this time from a student who graduated from UCLA with near spotless of a record, GPA-wise, MCAT-wise. I mean, you take a look at this science GPA. He hasn't seemed to have missed a single question in the entirety of his four years taking science classes. 80 credits, 4.0s across the board. Looks like he had one uh, couple of courses maybe in freshman year that were non-science where he earned non-As, probably a couple of A-minuses. So we have pretty much a near spotless record here, ending with a 3.98 GPA, 4.0 science, 3.92, all other. And then this is replicated on the MCAT. A 523 is a top one percentile score, 99th percentile score. Perfect on the chem phys section, 132, 130 on cars, 132 on biochem, bio biochem. So near again, perfect on kind of the science curricula. And then psych like social, the 129. And the AMC, as of, I think, 2021 or 2022, sometime during the COVID years, also started implementing the AMC preview test. It used to, it used to be the situational judgment test or something like this, the SJT. Uh, he, in order, he scored an 8, which is the 98th percentile. So, uh, great test taker. Looks like a great ethical situational judgment uh, type person. But this is kind of the context. You get this UCLA student who has a near perfect record and let's see what ends up happening. Um, conclusion wise, we'll just kind of come straight down to the bottom. Um, and just to protect his privacy, what ends up happening is he ends up getting into a fantastically competitive California medical school um, and earns a full ride scholarship there. I won't say which school, um, but a strong school in California coming out of UCLA, not paying a single dollar, actually being paid to go to medical school is a fantastic outcome. And you'll learn that there's much more to his GPA and MCAT. Uh, and that adds to the whole picture and milieu of the strength of this application. There's a ton to learn from. So conclusion number one, you're, you're going to see excellence really across the board for this application. When you start seeing excellence, your, your brain almost as a reader, at least in my perspective, was primed to look for more confirmatory evidence of excellence. When I saw that GPA, I saw the MCAT, I almost got anchored to thinking, oh, this guy is probably going to be real special. And the con is if the rest of your application falls flat, then you get this weird dissonance where it's like extremely strong stats, but dang, that the rest of the application was disappointing. Uh, but when you get a really strong stat applicant with a really strong extracurricular app application, and I'm sure the letters of recommendations were also extremely strong, then you start to think like, I need this applicant in my medical school and I'll do anything as in particular, give a full ride scholarship for the student to get this student here with us. So more confirmatory pieces of evidence. You saw 3.998 GPA, 523 MCAT. You'll see some uh, departmental awards for all of his research. Um, $25,000 and 1,000 patients that was served in uh, VCH, Vietnamese Community Health. Um, he fundraised $25,000. So you're starting to see more and more bits and pieces of evidence showing his excellence. And then he had a position where he was leading review sessions. Not only was he leading review sessions for his classic, you know, 20, 30 office hour typical session, but during midterm season, during final review season, he led these large group review sessions of a 300 plus people, right? So you're starting to see like the level of impact that he's having. And the comment that I wanted to make here is that if you think 
and revisit his themes from a 10,000 point, uh, 10,000 foot point of view, they're not really unique, right? It's teaching chemistry, right? Teaching and mentorship. This is community health, things that you've seen before. And this is research and everyone takes classes and takes the MCAT, but his level of impact is absolutely unique, right? How many people do you know with perfect stats? How many people do you know who have raised $25,000 in their community research project or community health project? Most folks end up just volunteering maybe once a quarter and then they do it eight times throughout their college career. So this level of leadership and impact is unique, even if the subject matters of the activities themselves are not unique. How many people do you know teach in some way, shape or fashion? Uh, but how many people do you know who teach review sessions of 300 plus people, almost as if he was professor in that Gen Chem class? So even though teaching underserved populations, community health and research sound generic, the level of his impact separates him from the rest. And you'll see that in his descriptions. Number two, think about the vibe that your writing gives. Uh, this gives kind of a simple, kind, perceptive, all of those interesting details that invite you to his inner world. Um, when you write, you are going to give the reader some sort of conclusion. They will take something away from it. And it's your job as a writer, and it's also helpful for you as an applicant to make sure that the way that you're writing encourages them to think of you in a certain way. You'll notice that there are a lot of phrasing, a lot of bits and pieces of vocabulary and terminology that he chooses in this application that make him sound perceptive, that make him sound simple, that make him sound kind. And these are all great words that you want as a part of your medical school class. He happens to have these characteristics and he's really freaking good at whatever he decides to do as uh, indicated by the level of impact. So if you can do the simple things in a world-class way, you will always be able to earn a white coat. You'll always have a medical school that wants you, right? The hard part is obviously getting the perfect stats, fundraising $25,000, teaching 300 plus people. But if you have a proclivity for teaching or you like the science classes and the coursework that you're in, like strive to be world-class, strive to be the best because there are outsized winner-take-all dynamics when you are that pre-med who operates at that level. Those are the conclusions. Let's get right into the evidence on his application that share all of this. So let's start from the top. Presentations and posters. I presented my undergraduate research project titled blank. Uh, Fiberblast, a live stream presentation at blank research showcase. So he was, he had an oral presentation that was live streamed. It wasn't just your typical poster. I also presented a poster of my work at the Department of Biology poster day. It was already had my work over the past year culminating these presentations and to share my research. Fine. So you're starting, you're starting to personify excellence, right? Most people just do research. One step up is doing research and having a poster. One step up is doing research, having a poster and winning an award. One step up is doing research, having a poster, winning an award, an award, and then being nominated for an oral presentation. An oral presentation is kind of the highest level of opportunity you can have for these um, research weeks. And he earns that with his research. So you're starting to see we're climbing up that impact ladder. Number two, um, academics, honors, and rewards again. So Dean's Prize for Excellence in Research, Dean's Prize, uh, 30 undergraduate students for outstanding presentations at the showcase, third prize in the poster day, summa cum laude. Okay. So there's some awards that are easy to understand. For example, Dean's Prize for Research Presentation means that he was one of the top 30 undergraduate students who had an outstanding presentation. But the rest of it is kind of hard to understand. I don't know what, like, sometimes people will write these uh, Charles Jenkins Awards for Community Health, and it is kind of hard to understand because we don't know how many people were um, trying to get the award. We don't know how many were involved in like what the criteria was for it. But if you have one of those awards that you're trying to share, just make sure that you're adding description like this, where it's around 30 undergraduate students and how many people presented, maybe about 300. So maybe it's like a top 10% award or something of the sort. Okay. So we'll continue to move on here. 
principal investigator, so lab assistant. I maintain a mouse colony with over 10 strains by setting up breeding and genotyping litters. I also mentor junior members in the lab by teaching them new techniques. I taught Ava, who had never held a micro pipette before, how to isolate RNA from cells. By continuing to work on my project, I strive to contribute to research that can inform the development of novel therapies to treat heart disease. I will also conduct a pilot study investigating in gene therapy to improve angiogenesis after myocardial infarction. I wish to not only improve the clinic, but also by making discoveries by the bench side. Okay. So uh, I just love like the level of confidence he carries himself in the lab. And maybe if you didn't tell me this person had a 4.0, 523 in the MCAT, I wouldn't feel that way. But now that I do know that, I know like as a reader, I'm biased and I'm anchored to that perception. And so I'm starting to see like everything he writes as uh, I'm painting it in like a level of excellence, a spotlight of excellence, and it is helping him, right? When he says, I will also conduct a pilot study. Immediately, my thought was like, that's cool. An undergrad or even a gap year student who's in charge of an entire pilot study looking into gene therapy, there's a level of confidence there in that tone of voice. And again, I might be just capping my head off and just uh, being anchored by his GP and MCAT. But if you have some of those strengths, lean into that persona because it elevates kind of the entirety of your application. The other thing I want to point out is that there's 300 hours completed in this lab and 1600 anticipated hours. This is kind of the devil of the gap year where you know that in 1600 hours, he'll have a lot to say. This might even be a most meaningful experience by the end of the year, but because he hasn't done it yet and he's applying at this time, he can't really expand because he hasn't lived those experiences yet. So for people looking to take gap years, just remember when you take one, your primary application will have been submitted already. So you'll do a lot of anticipation and oftentimes anticipation doesn't land as strongly as, uh, you may think. Okay. Physician shadowing, 50 hours, OBGYN, uh, family medicine, internal medicine. A common theme I observed while shadowing these physicians was the rapport and sense of trust that they built with their patients by taking time to thoroughly explain procedures and their clinical reasoning. So, I mean, this is very common with shadowing procedures, especially if you're trying to uh, lump a lot of them together. You just don't have a lot of characters. And so when you don't have a lot of characters, you generalize everything. I just want to point uh, point to this here. You can see the writing. It just falls very flat because there's no evidence. There's no story. There's no kind of core reflection. There's just a cliche sentence, which is physicians, rapport, trust, patients, like just a bunch of buzzwords. And then the evidence he shares is they took their time, essentially. So uh, just be cognizant of that. For these activities like shadowing, you just really want to show medical schools that you've done the shadowing. But um you will notice this type of writing for activities that should be meaningful. And that is a big no, no. Right. Um, okay. Next we'll start to get into our first most meaningful here where he's an undergraduate research assistant for 650 hours in the blank lab. I aim to investigate the role secreted vascular guidance factors play in angiogenesis after ischemic injuries, such as myocardial infarction. My independent research focused on evaluating changes in the expression of vascular guidance factors and cardiac fibroblasts following pathological stress. In mouse models, I used cell culture, qPCR, immunohistochemistry. I also led discussions about recently published cardiovascular biology papers during biweekly journal clubs. Okay. You're starting to see like a, a sense of responsibility, a sense of ownership, a sense that he's performing at the level of a graduate student in the lab because not many undergrads are leading discussions about papers in cardiovascular biology in their lab meetings. My involvement in research fostered my curiosity to more fully understand biological processes and contribute to knowledge. Okay. So, Looking under the microscope amplified the shakiness of my hands. This is the first time he writes with any kind of storytelling cadence, right? So let's see how it goes. Looking under the microscope amplified the shakiness of my hands as I failed to insert the cannula, cannula is a tube, into the incision in the mouse's abdominal aorta. I turned to my graduate student mentor who advised me to hold the incision open with my tweezers and align the cannula more parallel with the vessel. I turned to my graduate student mentor who advised me to hold the incision open with my tweezers and align the cannula more parallel with the vessel. 
Uh, so essentially, he's trying to put this tubing into the aortic vessel. Heeding his advice, I had tapped into the assertion again. I knew I'd successfully performed the maneuver when I saw the flashback of blood into the cannula. As I pushed saline through the cannula to retroperfuse the heart, I could see the coronary arteries begin to blanch as the solution replaced blood. I could see the coronary arteries blanch as the solution replaced blood. Excited by my progress, I continued practicing the technique for the rest of the day. Conducting research further cultivates my fascination for learning the intricacies of anatomy and physiology. Research allows me to apply the knowledge I learned in the classroom to explore unanswered questions and progress medicine through innovation. With each failure and success, research also drives me to think critically, details, troubleshoot, improve, pursue research in medical school and beyond. Okay, great. So, I mean, I think the uh, the details here just help you be a part of that laboratory room, right? We get this guy who is looking under a microscope and seeing his own hands shake, right? And he re- reflects on, I'll just make myself bigger for a little bit, but he reflects on how like he's trying to put this cannula or this tube into this cut that he made into the mouse's like literal abdominal aorta, the huge vessel that connects the heart to the rest of the body. And he's unable to put this tube. And I'm sure like this is kind of freaky for him. There's a mouse splayed open under a microscope. The mouse is probably on some sort of life support right now because there's a hole in the guy's abdominal aorta. And so he has to hold this tiny little vessel open, almost like he's doing plastic vascular surgery. Put the little tubing in parallel with the vessel so that it fits nicely into that vessel and then push some salts through that tube to perfuse the heart and um, see the the vessels on the heart get some of that salt water and uh, it's for the experiment that he's running with these cardiac fibroblasts and all this stuff. But you can imagine when he writes something like This cultivates my fascination for learning the intricacies of anatomy and physiology. It makes sense as to why, right? He was literally putting a tube into a vessel, pushing salt water, and then pushing all that salt into the mouse's heart. All of it right in front of him, all of it under a microscope, all of it with his own hands. And so these details are the things that just make you feel like you're a part of the entire journey as a reader. And I encourage you to journal, write, reflect. You can use AI tools like uh, Ramble Fix. Um, Those are things that will all help you take the remember these details so that you can have them in the future when it's time for you to write the details will make the experience shine right this is a ai that i've been using just playing around with but you speak your mind you can ramble into it say something like hello dave i'm yes so today i'm reaching out can you fix the thingy uh let me know are you enjoying it and then ai will kind of clean it up for you so that you can have clear concise details even if your mind is not clear and concise Okay, let's go back. Next, we have um, Vietnamese Community Health Finance Director, 400 hours. My primary responsibility is VCH's finance director. We're applying to university grants, transportation, and reimbursements. I applied to 17 grants, receiving over 25,000 in funding awards. I also arranged transportation for over 360 volunteers, 40 miles away in Orange County, securing these funds to serve 1,000 patients by providing free health supplies, services, and education. Um, Okay, I feel empowered to continue making a difference. So data is everything. You can see here that even in this small, tiny 700 character experience, he had 17 funding grants, $25,000, 360 volunteers, 40 miles away, 1,000 patients served. It really helps you demonstrate that level of impact and excellence. And if you have numbers to share, I would 100% share them. Even if you feel like they're not impressive, they always, always, always add a level of specificity that help the reader get a sense of uh, kind of where you're coming from. Next, clinical research associate. So a lot of research experiences thus far, research awards, scholarships, publications, different experiences. I volunteer in an outpatient clinic for an initiative which aims to engage a diverse sample of patients in precision health research. I recruit patients by observing their consent to use remnants of samples collected for labs or genomics research. 
Uh, one patient who improved Sarah was concerned that she may have to undergo additional needle sticks. I sat down with her and explained that the samples would only be collected during routine lab work during her visits to the clinic. As with Sarah, I aim to provide each future patient in my care with the knowledge necessary to make informed decisions regarding this health, right? A lot of students will write this, informed decisions regarding their health. And then they'll say, Mike, there's no way I can write anything specific about this because, you know, informed decision making, informed consents, you have to be a doctor to walk people through the risks, benefits, and alternatives for their surgery or the risks, benefits, and alternatives for this medication. And I say, no, you, you don't have to. You can provide medical not you can provide medical education that's like related to the care, but you can just provide education or health information that helps them make decisions. In this case, Sarah, who was not really looking forward to being a part of the study because she felt like she had to undergo more, you are able to step in and tell her, no, that's actually not true. What happens is whatever lab is extra after your normal lab work, that will go to us. And so that simple story in this simple role is able to make this cliche land, right? Cliches are common because a lot of pre-meds experience them and they're good things to experience. But without the specific story, you will sound generic, mediocre, and kind of fade out. But even if you have a straightforward story like this one, just sharing the policy of the blood and how, it, how it's almost essentially recycled, um, you can have those cliches land on your side. Next, we have tutoring. I started tutoring Adam after he failed his first intro to bio quiz. During each session, I helped Adam obtain a deeper understanding of the material by emphasizing connections between concepts instead of rote memorization. I also taught Adam new study techniques such as space repetition, creating his own test questions. He raised his grade to an A and earned A's on every assessment in every second semester. What was even more gratifying was nurturing this interest in science. By the end of our time together, biology transferred from a subject that Adam dreaded into one he wanted to study further. Right. Again, it doesn't have to be a number, but as if there's a story, if there's evidence, if there's progression, like you want to paint these for your reader so that they're on the same page with you, so that they're rooting for you and supporting you. In this case, you get Adam who uh, finally starts getting A's. Then he gets A's on every semester or every test after that in the second semester. And then he starts in this transformation where he doesn't like biology because he's not good at it. And then he's starting to get really good at it. And he realizes that he actually likes the subject. And so these concepts, stories, things of that sort help um, your writing go further. COVID contact tracer, 360 hours. First surge in COVID cases, I started volunteering as a contact tracer because I wanted to lessen the impact of COVID. Through interviewing COVID positive patients on the phone, I witnessed how the pandemic disproportionately affected certain communities, such as service workers and immigrants. Okay, so he makes his claim. Let's see how he supports it. During my call with Mark, I learned that he contracted COVID at the grocery store he worked at and was having trouble isolating himself because he lived in a multi-generational household. He works in a very public place. He goes home to a very public er, uh, place with many people. Together, we devised a plan to minimize the risk of spreading the virus to his family members. My experience as a contact tracer further inspired me to learn more about social determinants of health. So it's interesting, right? I think... Uh, six feet of separation is not feasible for some people, including this person here who works in a grocery store and then goes home, shares one bathroom amongst grandma, father and wife, uh, I mean, a husband and wife, and then kids, right? There's no way that you can not have any sort of like mutual shared space between people who live all in that one household. And so he makes this claim that he sees the pandemic disproportionately affect certain communities. And then he explains it with this fantastic story, simple story again of Mark. Something that would have made it stronger is he writes, together we devised a plan to minimize the risk of spreading the virus. I wish he told us about that plan because again, that's more evidence that he knows what he's talking about. He can share his own experience working with someone who had this very real problem. All right. So we got club tennis, started playing tennis at the beginning of the pandemic. Gyms are closed. Tennis was one of the safest activities. Play with my dad, sharing this passion with my dad. Brought us closer together, which is especially important during lockdowns. Learning a new sport is challenging, but I dedicated myself to improving my game with each practice session. Eventually joined the club tennis team. 
and he's an outlet. Okay, so you're starting to know this guy a little bit better outside of work, right? So he goes to work, puts tubes into mouse's aortic vessels, does some tutoring, uh, does a lot of research, and then on his free time, plays tennis with his dad. Okay, care extender. My duties as a care extender, including assisting nurses with patient care, providing their families with emotional support. After I transported Ed, a liver patient, to the ICU, I noticed his mother anxiously standing outside alone. I stepped out to sit with her, offered encouragement, and asked her how Ed ended up in the hospital. I learned how Ed had a history with alcohol use, his attempts to get sober, and his mother's worries about his eligibility for a transplant. As she continued to share Ed's stories with me, her anxiousness ceased. I learned that while Ed's medical care was important, providing his mom company and comfort was important too, right? I just love when students recognize that they don't have to be the hero of the story, right? Uh, there's kind of three levels. And I'll just make myself a little bit bigger for this conversation, but three levels, right? One is you're the hero of the story. You saved the life. You transplanted the liver yourself. And a lot of pre-meds will write in a way that makes it feel like that, which is completely like off base, not true and unnecessary. You don't need to be the hero of the story. Level number two is you are part of the story and you're a hero of a very small segment of the story. And this is my personal favorite where um, you didn't do the transplant. You didn't talk to Ed and talk him off the edge and help him stop his 20 years of alcohol abuse so that he could be eligible for a transplant. That's not what you did, but you were a hero of that corner with you and the mom learning Ed's story, learning about Ed's mom's worries about him not being eligible for a transplant and you're a hero for that corner, right? That's my favorite approach. Approach number three is that you share the perspective of another hero of the story, right? Maybe you talk about the liver transplant surgeon or the doctor that you notice or the nurse that you notice who also had this fantastic bedside conversation and bedside manner with the patient and his family. Um, that can work, but also it's always like one step removed. So I don't love it. I just love it when you are taking charge, owning responsibility for your segment of the story, no matter how small you think it is, it is always a significant portion of the patient experience, um, to support the caretaker, to listen to the mother, to just, um, be there present, right? I think a lot of pre-meds underplay or undermine the role of listening, having a conversation, asking appropriate questions, right? You don't need to know medical knowledge. You don't need to know medical terminology because of your scribing job. You don't need to be the greatest researcher on the planet, but you can have impact in these small ways. And as long as you're able to own up to them and take charge, uh, be responsible for that part of the story, I think it's very real. And I think it's very helpful to paint you in a very positive, productive um, pre-med that doesn't overextend himself. And I just love how he does that here. Okay, next. Uh, we're back to Vietnamese Community Health, but in this case, uh, when he was a volunteer. So I joined Blank to make a tangible difference improving the health of medically underserved Vietnamese and Hispanic immigrant communities, providing free medical service and education. I grew up in an area with few Vietnamese people, also let me connect better to my cultural roots. At biweekly health sites and quarterly health fairs, I administered basic health services such as blood pressure screenings and interpreted for Spanish-speaking patients during consultations with healthcare providers. As many patients suffered from chronic medical conditions, volunteering VCs sparked my interest in preventative care and community medicine. So I sat next to Anna with my clipboard and asked her why she came to VCH's health fair. As part of the registration process, I was responsible for recording Anna's medical history. As a native Spanish speaker, Anna had limited English proficiency. And as one of the volunteers with proficient Spanish, I was able to converse with Anna using hand gestures to indicate different parts of the body and describe symptoms in simple Spanish terms. I was able to record her chief complaint. She had chronic low back pain that worsened when sitting or standing ever since she had gotten a lumbar puncture. Unable to an afford another visit to the hospital, she came to the health fair to speak with a doctor about her health issues. I referred Anna to the physicians and other providers on site. She thanked me for her efforts to interpret for her. I was also grateful to have earned Anna's trust in that short encounter, such that she felt comfortable disclosing her lumbar puncture history to me. 
Um, treating VCH's patient demographic has revealed gaps in healthcare access, such as linguistic and financial barriers, as evidenced by Anna, who both can't speak English and um, doesn't can't afford another hospital visit. I was also grateful to have earned, uh, uh, that I was less aware of previously. As a physician, I hope to reveal these fill these gaps by providing medical care and education for underserved communities. Okay, great. So this is. Um, Again, I, I just love how he doesn't overextend himself. He's not painting this verbose, unbelievable situation where he figures out a rare diagnosis and gets in into the rest of his care, follows up after a month because of his own accord, and then Anna is happily ever after, right? No, he translated for Anna. He asked what was going on. Anna said she had back pain after she got this lumbar puncture but can't afford to go back to the hospital, and that's it. It was probably a five to seven minute conversation summarized into two sentences. And it shows and captures the linguistic and financial barriers that he's talking about here. It's a very real example, and it can be demonstrated through the simplest of stories. He doesn't do anything more than that, which I wholeheartedly appreciate. Okay. Next, we have a uh, undergraduate assistant here. I led weekly peer learning sessions with about 50 students in, in attendance. 50 students every week is kind of a ton. During these sessions, I reviewed self-developed worksheets to teach students important concepts and problem solving skills. While my sessions were only two hours, pretty long, I often stayed an extra hour to answer students' questions and cover all the material. Before midterms and finals, I also prepared review sessions for hundreds of students. Gen Chem was the first university STEM class for many of my students who often felt intimidated by the complexity of the material. Forming long-term connections with students and providing them guidance as a UA fueled my passion for education and mentoring others. So you get a sense of the scale here, right? So 50 students every single week, uh, every single week, at least two hours, often three, so he could fill and answer every single student's question. Um, and I remember how tiring this was as a, as a uh, molecular biology learning facilitator myself. You stay there deep into the night. You're talking and talking and talking. And uh, one of the things that you're most grateful for is if one of your students decide to walk through the, the problem for the rest of the class so that you could get a break from the talking. Right. Um, I'm starting to resonate with this, as I imagine most readers will be as anyone who has taught for extended periods of time, especially on their feet. I could barely see the back row of students packed like sardines in the lecture hall. Over 300 students had attended the review session I was hosting before the first midterm of the quarter. It was daunting, staring into the audience, knowing I had never taught this many students at once before. I took a deep breath to relax and started reviewing a stoichiometry problem. As I wrote the solution underneath the document camera, my hand was trembling. As the session progressed, however, my confidence grew with each solution explained and each student's question answered. At the end of the session, many students spoke to me about how the review session gave them confidence to do well on the midterm. From the first review session to my last, it was rewarding to motivate students to learn. Through teaching, I had become more cognizant of the diverse educational backgrounds of my students. While some students had prior exposure to college chemistry, many also did not have solid backgrounds in math or science. It was especially fulfilling to create a supportive environment where students felt empowered to succeed regardless of their past. I hope to carry the appreciation for diversity and inclusivity I gained as a UA into a career in medicine. All right? Again, if you do crazy cool impactful things. The details will tell itself. You won't need to write in a flowery, abundant, creative storytelling way. You can see this is actually a very simple story as have all his stories have been. The thing that really makes this stark is that 300 students had attended the review session. That piece of proof alone tells the entire story of impact that you need to know, right? He tells this creative details of his hand trembling and all this stuff. But um, if you remember the mouse being injected with salt water, that's part of it because we can't really relate to having a mouse splayed open with a vessel pulsatiling in our face, cutting that like a plastic or vascular 
plastic surgeon or vascular microsurgeon, um, and then putting a cannula and pushing in some salt water. We can't really all uh, relate to that. And so it's his job as a writer to really paint that scene. But in this case, we all can relate to this. Being in a lecture hall or even being on the other side teaching a set of students, now just ramp it up to 300, right? 300 students doing and looking at you as you are going through a problem. They're all depending on you so that they can learn and do well on their first midterm. Most of them have never taken a class of this caliber before. If you do awesome stuff, the writing will take care of itself. And this is, I mean, this is so important. I'm just going to magnify myself again, but this is essentially the takeaway of this entire application. The more impactful things you do, the more your application will write itself. You, I, I have this phrase where um, you cannot make chicken salad out of chicken shit. So if your application, your activities are not inspiring, you didn't love them, they don't really thematically make sense with your interests and passions, that's essentially what I refer to as chicken shit. And in order to transform that on your written application, you're going to have to write in a very persuasive, perfect, creative, picture, uh, efficient, every single writing strategy that you'll need will have to come to the plate to convert that chicken shit into chicken salad. Right. But in this case, this student has an array of experiences that are chicken salad, right? Teaching 300 plus experience, uh, students, having a fantastic uh, re- level of responsibility in his cardiac mouse lab, 3.98 GPA, 523 MCAT, excellence on excellence on excellence on excellence, $25,000 fundraised, 1,000 patients served in the community health fairs. That's chicken salad. And you can write chicken salad in any way that you want. There is almost no way that you can write it in a way that it sounds like chicken shit, right? And this is a very clear example of how he is doing that. Okay. Um, so you're starting to see the impact, right? You, you see a little bit of his inner world. Yeah, my hand trembled. But again, look at the scale. Every week, 50 students show up, three hours at a time. Midterm review, 300 students show up. He is a professor at the age of 21, right? Not a lot of people have that level of impact or experience, and that's why it's so stark. Okay, next, learning assistance. I uh, assist students with implementing code in a mathematical modeling course. One student, Ben, called me to help him with his code that was returning an error. I identified the bug in Ben's code and reviewed the syntax he was having trouble understanding. I also paired him with a student who was more experienced so that they could work together on group assignments. By encouraging collaboration, I fostered an inclusive space where students could focus on learning without fear of judgment. Okay, fantastic, right? Let us move on to this personal statement and then we will wrap up. We'll review this conclusion sets, uh, set of conclusions to see if you guys feel differently about it now that you've seen the entire application. Let's start here. Under the blazing Southern California sun, the soft whirring of the blood pressure machine cuff tightened around Amy's arm. It was the only sound I focused on among the bustling crowd. Amy was a middle-aged Vietnamese woman who attended Vietnamese Community Health Health Fair, seeking free medical services and educational materials. The cuff hissed as it slowly deflated, and a sharp beep directed my eyes toward the blood pressure reading. I was shocked. 180 over 110. She needed immediate medical attention. At first glance, she appeared physically healthy. She was not overweight, not in pain, but her outward experience hid her uncontrolled hypertension. I informed Amy about her abnormal results, directed her to the physician on site, and assured that she would be taken care of. When I returned to my station, I could not take my mind off of Amy's situation. I realized how earlier medical attention could have identified her hypertension and prevented it from progressing. I left my first health fair determined to explore a career path where I could impact patients' lives by doing more than just a blood pressure screening. Okay. So he spends the first two paragraphs painting the scene. Again, very simple volunteer experience. He's just really pressing a button, running the blood pressure, reading that number and going, oh, that's very high. Let's get her to the doctor. Right. I love the contrast that he writes with here. At first class, she appeared healthy, but she was not overweight and she was not in pain, but her number was terrible. Right. You get these uh, uh, in medicine. These are called like silent killers. You'll feel completely fine until you have a catastrophic event. And um, this is a great way to kind of capture that 
with uh, the contrast that he writes it with. As I continued to volunteer with VCH, I kept seeing patients suffering from chronic conditions such as diabetes, high cholesterol. I would refer each patient to the physician present so that they could receive a proper diagnosis and treatment plan. Seeing the hope on their face to finally get their health concerns addressed inspired me to make a difference in the medically underserved populations as a physician. I intend not only to treat their illness, but also provide health education to help perform or inform patients of ways to take control of their health and prevent chronic disease. Okay. So what I write here, you get a sense of the recurring message in his head. You start to learn more about his inner world. Okay, let's see. My experiences in VCH led me to seek opportunities for patient interaction in a more formal clinical setting by volunteering at the UCLA Medical Center. During one of my first shifts, I saw a patient named John, bloated abdomen, jaundiced skin. John was on the waiting list for another liver transplant, but had to be admitted to the hospital because his conditioning was worsening. Unfortunately, John's condition continued to deteriorate, and I had to help him. I had to help rush him to the ICU. When my shift ended that night, I went home thinking about John. Will he get better in the ICU? Will I see him the next time I go to the hospital? Those questions remained with me until about a month later when I had finished transporting another patient to the hospital pharmacy. Looking across the room, I noticed a familiar face. It was John. John looked like a brand new person, almost unrecognizable from when I had last seen him in the ICU. I called his name and luckily he recognized me too. We talked and I was delighted to learn that he had been recently discharged after a successful liver transplant. Even though I did not witness the operation on John, their work was apparent. I left the hospital that day in awe of the transformative process of power of medicine. I also hope to have that ability to make such a drastic improvement in a patient's life as a physician. Right? So now you're going to start to see like, there's this young 18, 19 year old who does great in science classes, wants to be a doctor. And then he sees like a first real patient, patient with a huge stomach and he's yellow, more yellow than any fluorescent light you've ever seen. And he's getting, he looks very ill, has to be transported to the ICU and the movie cuts there. The volunteer goes home, does his OCHEM and GenChem and physics homework and uh, continues with his research and never sees John again until a month later, John looks fantastic. You can start to see just like in his head, he's starting to pick up these like, whoa, that is actually amazing type of thoughts, right? And you're starting to see that in the writing. Again, this is, uh, remember the three methods I told you. Number one is you're the hero of some unbelievable story, like you are the liver transplant surgeon. Number two is uh, you tell the heroism of your small pocket of the story, which in this case, um, he's not the, the hero of the story, right? He doesn't choose that angle. But three is when he says uh, actively, you know, I wasn't part of the operation, but their work and their transformative power of the surgery was apparent. He got a new liver. He looks fantastic. He's much more healthy than I last saw him. And so this is my second favorite, number three, where he kind of applauds the heroic actions of another person. I like this one because, again, you're not overextending. You're just telling your truth and really the thoughts that you had when you saw someone who looked like they were on death's door suddenly one month ago, one month ago later at the hospital pharmacy picking up his medications ready to go home. I have also learned that medicine extends beyond healing patients with the science. It's also about forming communication uh, connections with people in their most vulnerable moments and giving them comfort. One night to volunteering at the hospital, I met Gina, who's admitted for diabetes complications. Similar to Amy, I wondered how her different how different her life might have been if she had earlier medical care for diabetes. As a nurse inspected her gangrenous toes, her body tensed and her face winced. She said she felt her condition would never improve and she could not bear the pain. It's depressing. I encouraged Gina to remain helpful as she was in good hands with the medical team. She allowed us to tenderly apply dressings and ointment and she relaxed and breathed a sigh of relief. I felt glad to earn Gina's trust and help her through a difficult moment. I will strive to uplift each patient I treat by providing compassion and hope. Look again, like I just love how he comes across very straightforward, very simple, very kind, very thoughtful, very perceptive. He's not overdoing it. I see so much writing where the pre-med is just sharing this unbelievable story and saying, I don't have any uh, thing to talk about, but look at, look at this writer's stories simple stories about dressing someone's wounds as a hospital volunteer, right? Understanding that patients are only who they are during this specific slice of time. So I just really appreciated that he wrote 
Um, I just wonder what her life was before all this happened. Or I wonder what her life could have been if she got diabetes treatment earlier, like Amy at the health fair. Right. I love these parallels. I love how simple they are. I love how he shows the impact of relatively straightforward conclusions. Another avenue through which I realize I can improve the health of others is through research. I'm developing a passion for cardiovascular biology, my anatomy and physiology coursework. I joined a lab to study therapies for ischemic heart disease. With each new technique I learned, experiment I performed and finding I made, my curiosity to continue making new discoveries blossomed. While I plan to play a direct role in healing patients, my enthusiasm for inquiry also compels me to make contributions to research that will enhance patient treatments and further scientific understanding. My experiences during my undergraduate years have driven me towards a mission of healing through health education, advancing medical knowledge and service. A career in medicine allows me to work towards this fulfilling this mission mission as it integrates my curiosity for understanding the complexities of human biology, desire to improve the health of my communities, and hope to treat patients like Amy, John, and Gina. Okay. Fantastic. So again, I just want to just go back to the conclusions. It was really like the excellence is clear. Near perfect GPA, near perfect MCAT, a ton of money fundraised for VMU's community health, a thousand patients served in a year, teaching three hundred plus people in a general chemistry review session and 50 people every single week for three hours every week. He's not unique in the things that he's interested in. He does some research. He plays some tennis. He does some, re, uh, he does some teaching. He's in a community health organization, but the level of excellence, the level of world-classness, the 1% type of impact and results that he's getting, those are the things that separate him. Those are the things that kept him as a UCLA student coming from the most competitive state in California or yeah, most kind of state in the, in America for, um, medical school admissions, which is California and earned a full ride to his number one school. Right. The reason is not that he's unique, not that he is some heroic superstar pre-med, but that he does the simple, straightforward things that he likes and enjoys. Some may say that it's basic. Some may say that it's generic, but I say that is impactful and stands out because of just how dang good he is. Right. The writing is standard. He shares his inner thoughts. He shares very simple stories. He shares data. He doesn't swing for the fences because his entire application already has, is made completely of chicken salad. He leans on the chicken salad. He shares you the chicken salad numbers. And he knows that because of his experiences and how strong they are, there's no way he could write anything that is chicken shit. So hopefully you learn by just how simple and straightforward this application is. This is easily one of the strongest applications in the nation just by results alone double digit interviews multiple acceptances um actually let me get you the specifics on that and here are the exact details right 42 primaries submitted 39 secondaries submit some pretty early late july late august or about average interviews from university of arizona phoenix some california med school that he's at now very competitive georgetown um and then he ends up being accepted to the fantastic California medical school, close to home, close to the support system, in-state tuition, strong prestige, strong program, and gets a full tuition scholarship that makes his medical education debt-free. It was a no-brainer for a fantastic applicant. I hope that you guys learn that you don't need to be some special, unique snowflake applicants that is only interested in something so niche. I know when I showed Steve's application, a lot of folks think that you need to do some prison education thing or find something especially super unique, like the intersection of artificial intelligence and medicine, just so that you can stand out in that way. But this is a classic example of pre-med that does the stuff that he just likes. And they can be simple. They can be teaching. They can be research. They can be underserved populations. But he does it at such a world-class level that that is the thing that stands out. Hopefully this helped you. Hopefully you can take the stuff that you're involved with to the next level, especially if those are things that you enjoy. If they are things that you do not enjoy, hopefully you reconsider so that you can spend more time doing the things you love. Thanks for listening. Thank you for your time. And I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.